to Solar Eurasian. And um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Australian National University and also welcome people to the country. So I'd like to acknowledge the Ngunnawal people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we are meeting and pay our respects to the elders past and present of the Ngunnawal people. So we are going to talk about the transition to high levels of solar and wind, a very rapid transition happening in Australia. We are um, very grateful to um, Drew Clark for agreeing to give the solar oration, um, but we have a, a few things to get through before Drew makes his um, speech. We have the um, a possibility to make comments and questions after his talk from about seven o'clock onwards. And those in the room can use a real microphone or they can also use the VVOX system, which is available to those in the room if they log on or, um, and also of course, those who are here virtually. I'd like to congratulate a person who has undertaken a PhD at the Australian National University and has been awarded the 2022 Solar Thesis Prize. So this person is Jingjing Chen and she was supervised by Boichi Pinsky who is in the room today and uh, Joe Coventry and Apu Kumar. And the topic of the of the thesis was radiative heat transfer in directly irradiated, irradiated high temperature particle gas flows. So this is effectively a method of collecting concentrated solar thermal light from a field of mirrors. It's um, directed onto a falling stream of particles. The particles get hot and that is the way that the light is absorbed to create heat. And uh, she has um, done a very fine thesis and is now, I believe, gone back to Hong Kong where I think she won another prize and um, will contribute hopefully to the future of solar energy around the world. So this is the VBOX app. You can um, click on the uh, QR code there. Um, you can of course also do it uh, verbally in the room. And I look forward to an active participation in the discussion after um, uh, Drew has finished his talk. Has everyone had a chance to get that? Sorry? All right, so the next thing is a report from Shane Raffenbury, who is the Minister for Energy in the SUT government about the approach of Canberra towards zero emissions in 2045. Uh, this is a traditional part of the solar oration and Canberra is without doubt uh, the leading uh, sub-national jurisdiction in Australia in terms of speed to, uh, to zero emissions. Yuma, Darawa Nuna, Darawa Nunawal. Hello, this is Ngunnawal country and I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we all gather today. I'm really pleased to be able to join you. Unfortunately, it is virtually. I can't be there in person this year as I did have an outstanding commitment, but it's a great opportunity to update you on the ACT's progress to net zero emissions by 2045. The ACT government is proud of Canberra's climate ambitions and our strong partnerships, including with the ANU. The ACT remains a leader on climate action, both nationally and internationally. We have long been championing the use of renewable energy and since 2020 our city has been powered by 100% renewable electricity. As we maintain this commitment and look to the next stage of our climate ambition, we can be proud of all that we have achieved so far in the partnership with the community, researchers, businesses and the renewable sector. We do have a long-term vision and exciting projects underway to help build a sustainable and secure zero emissions future. This includes installing large and small batteries to help manage demand, electrifying our remaining fossil fuel dependent assets, increasing our uptake of zero emission vehicles, 
and improving energy efficiency. Now that we have reduced greenhouse gas emissions from our electricity consumption to zero, our highest sources of emissions come from our fossil fuel gas use at around 20% and the transport se sector, which accounts for over 60%. In August this year, we announced the ACT will transition away from fossil fuel gas use to renewable electricity, with the potential use of renewable gases for niche applications, and we'll do all of that by 2045. One of the first key steps in our transition will be the introduction of regulations in 2023 that will prevent new gas network connections. We need to stop making the problem worse, and this will help to ensure that our emissions from gas do not grow and will support our transition away from this polluting energy source. While gas will continue to play an important part in the ACT's energy mix for at least the next decade, it is important that consumers are not locking themselves into higher gas prices by purchasing new gas appliances today that could well last for more than 15 years. The ACT community is already transitioning away from fossil fuel gas use, and this is being driven by environmental concerns a shift in consumer preferences and householders seeking lower energy bills. And we're helping households make this transition. Electrifying our city and transitioning to a net zero emissions economy will mean a lot of change. As we make these changes, we will be working to ensure a just transition with targeted support for those in our community who most need it and retraining for effective workers where needed. Having shifted to 100% renewables, we are now looking to expand battery storage in the ACT. Through developing battery storage, electricity supply can be firmed by storing excess variable renewable electricity during the day and discharging it at times of peak demand. The ACT's big battery project will deliver a, at least 250 megawatts of large scale battery storage. This will be achieved through the development of several batteries that can vary in size. Together, these batteries will form a battery ecosystem that includes large scale batteries on the electricity grid, primarily focused on national energy market services, smaller batteries at government sites such as schools, and medium scale batteries on the distribution grid, focused on local network support, community battery models, and innovative technical and commercial solutions. The batteries will be in place by 2025, and the current technologies being considered by the Territory have an operating life of around 10 years or more. The ACT has also implemented the $25 million Next Generation Energy Storage Program, which provides Canberrans a rebate to have a battery installed at their home or business, and we've seen terrific uptake of that program. The Sustainable Households Scheme has also seen terrific uptake by ACT residents since its formal launch in September last year. The scheme has received over 9,000 applications and nearly $100 million has been approved in loans to support households to become more energy efficient and sustainable through appliance upgrades to move away from gas, support for electric vehicles and rooftop solar and batteries. Rooftop solar purchased through the scheme now generates about 38 megawatts of renewable electricity which contributes to over 5% of the Territory's peak demand. Coupled with installation of over 1,200 household batteries, this will help reduce participating households' energy costs by a combined total of nearly $15 million each year. Further, the installation of energy efficient products such as hot water heat pumps, efficient heating and cooling systems, as well as efficient electric cooktops will further reduce annual residential energy costs by about $1.5 million. So we can see here that we're not only reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also reducing energy, household energy bills, which is a great outcome for the city overall. We are also working towards reducing emissions from our transport sector, of course. The ACT has the highest rate of zero emission vehicles, or ZEVs, uh, per capita in Australia, and ZEV sales are growing strongly. Growth in ZEV sales has even outperformed the growth in fuel vehicle sales in recent years. But there is a lot of work to be done with ZEVs, making up less than 1% of registered vehicles here in the ACT. In July this year, I released the ACT's new Zero Emission Vehicles Strategy. This strategy signals an ambitious future for ZEV sales in the ACT, including setting a sales target to have 80 to 90% of new vehicle sales that are ZEVs by 2030. 
the new strategy includes measures to support EV uptake by people living in apartments, including grants for EV charger installation at apartment buildings and a tailored education program to support building managers to install EV charging infrastructure. It also includes additional investment in public EV charging infrastructure with an additional 50 public charging stations to be rolled out across the city over the next year, substantially increasing the fleet of available charging stations. The strategy also signals a phase out of internal combustion engine vehicles in the ACT from 2035. Since the ACT announcement in July that we were going to do that, both California and the European Union have announced similar phase outs, which is very encouraging and shows that we are definitely on the right track. We will work together with other jurisdictions, with the federal government, with actors in the global market and with the community in order to increase ZEV uptake to the levels required and ensure that we meet our emissions reduction targets. As I mentioned earlier, ensuring a just transition is a high priority in our climate action work here in the Territory. This means protecting the most vulnerable in our community and ensuring that as many Canberrans as possible have the opportunity to benefit from improved energy efficiency, electrification and reduced energy costs. Poorly insulated and energy inefficient homes contribute to high energy consumption, higher bills and poor thermal comfort. And it is often renters and those with the lowest incomes who are living in the least efficient properties that have the highest energy bills and or negative health impacts from extreme heat and cold from these properties that are poorly insulated. We provide a range of education campaigns and support programs, including those tailored to renters and low-income households. And these programs aim to improve energy efficiency and thermal comfort, and of course, reduce bills to the benefit of those households. Our Home Energy Support Program offers financial and educational support for Canberra's most vulnerable households to replace inefficient appliances and improve thermal efficiency. To support energy efficient housing for renters, the ACT government is also in the process of introducing a regulation that will mandate a minimum level of ceiling insulation in rental homes in the ACT. This is a really powerful development that can reduce our emissions through reducing dependency on gas heating in poorly insulated homes, but also making sure that renters are living in more comfortable homes with lower energy bills. These improvements at the household and business level can also collectively make huge improvements for, for our energy security through decreasing energy demand. In summary, we have made great progress here in the ACT to this point, thanks to the bright minds working in our community and strong support for climate action by everyone in Canberra. It has been a challenging year in energy policy, and you'll have seen this in some of the headlines, but it is also an exciting time as new technologies emerge and the renewable energy industry further develops. While there remains a lot of work to be done and we can't rest on our laurels, our 2025 and 2030 emission reduction targets are ambitious, but I am optimistic about our ability to meet them. This is largely because of the expertise and commitment we have in our city and our strong and growing renewables and zero emissions sectors. We are committed to building a sustainable net zero emissions future for our city it empowers our community and our local industries to be part of that transition. I look forward to collaborating with all of you to make this a reality, and I thank the ANU for their important work to support a shift to renewable energy and effective climate action. He for our Solar Research Centre, and he has gone on to have an illustrious career uh, with a strong interaction with energy throughout the career and I think has made a really substantial difference to the way in which Australians think about energy. So he's currently the chair of the Australian Energy Market Operator um, Board and um, was until recently a director of CSRO. He has had a senior role at the secretary level in the Australian Public Service and for a while was the chief of staff of Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. So Drew, I'd like, like to invite you to deliver the oration. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Blakers, for that introduction. And thank you to the ANU for inviting me to give this year's solar oration. 
Thanks also to the audience that's uh, come out tonight uh, here in Canberra and to those watching online. And let me add my acknowledgement to the traditional owners of these lands. My presentation is largely based on a CSIRO report that I've co-authored with Paul Graham, which we hope to publish soon. I'd like to also thank AEMO colleagues for their advice. But while my observations today are informed by my various roles in the energy sector over the last 20 years, the opinions I'll express are mine alone. So I'll cover three topics uh, that I've just summarised here, uh, mostly from a big picture public policy perspective. Uh, first, I'll outline the three transitions that have already occurred in Australian electricity. Then I'll characterise the current transition uh, to net zero emissions. And finally, I'll talk about the requirements for that transition to be successful. Along the way, I'll talk a little about energy transitions in general, and we'll have a close look at a day in the life of part of the electricity system to illustrate some of the transition dynamics. So before diving back into Australian electricity history, I want to provide some context by talking briefly about energy transitions and the dimensions that are unique to Australia. Energy transitions have been widely studied, examining the evolution of energy production and use over centuries, usually at a global or national scale. These transitions, occurring at different rates and times in different countries, have profound social and economic dimensions and often political and geopolitical dimensions. My focus this evening is on Australian electricity but there are several aspects that collectively make us unique. The dimensions which shape Australian electricity today include our political structure, a liberal democracy formed by the Federation of States and Territories with a constitution that makes energy a state matter. The mixed public and private ownership of energy companies, our industry structure, particularly the limits we have placed on vertical integration within the sector, the extent or absence of interconnection of the state-based grids. Our governance model with independent market bodies operating under legislation and rules. Our market structure with competitive and regulated components. The fuel mix with our abundant fossil and renewable resources. Our technologies of both central and distributed and finally, the tyranny of distance as a sparsely populated island continent. We have no electricity neighbours. In this context, we now have the global climate imperative. We have an urgent time frame to transition the Australian economy to net zero emissions. And the key to 75% of the economy's emissions is our electricity sector. Historically, at a global level, it took 130 years for coal-fired steam to replace pre-industrial biomass, then a further 80 years for oil, gas and electricity to replace coal steam for primary energy use. By contrast, Australia is now in the process of replacing a centralised fossil fuel-based electricity system with a renewables-based system, including massive distributed resources in just a few decades. So here's the big picture showing total electricity by fuel from 1900 through to 2050, as compiled by my colleague Paul Graham. The three historic transitions in this data set working across the timeline are early electrification from 1900 to 1950 a period of state development from 1950 to 2000, and then a disruption period from 2000 to 2020. The net zero transition from 2020 to 2050 is based on scenarios. I'll talk later about the uncertainties in this part of the data set. First though, let's look at the last 120 years. So let's start with early electrification from 1900 to 1950. Just before then, the first use of, of electricity in Australia was actually in 1863 in the colonial era, when a single arc lamp on Sydney's Observatory Hill 
was lit to celebrate a British royal event. It was, after all, a British colony. The 1901 Australian Constitution retained energy as a state matter, much like the railway systems. So we really have multiple state histories, but they all followed very similar paths. At Federation, municipal authorities, private companies and the railways had begun electrification of urban street lights, tramways and industry. The total generating capacity then was 13 megawatts. That's about half the size of the Royale solar farm here in the ACT, or the size of a single modern offshore wind turbine. State electricity commissions were established during this period, bringing a centrally planned approach. The dominant fuel was coal, and the initial physical model was to transport the coal to the city power station. The first use of electricity transmission lines where the power station is located adjacent to the fuel and the electricity is transported was in Hobart in 1916 with a line out to a hydro facility. And then in 1924, the transmission connecting the Latrobe Valley lignite brown coal power to Melbourne. At that time, General Sir John Monash, a civil engineer by training, was chairman of the State Electricity Commission of Victoria and president of the Australasian Association for the Advancement of Science. In his 1924 presidential address to the association, Monash noted that electrical engine energy is destined to expand until it may even dominate future civilization. Expand until it may even dominate future civilization, transforming the whole social fabric with demand likely to exceed by many times the most sanguine expectations. If Monash were alive today, we'd give him a job as a forecaster. <laughs> then let's look at the state development period from 1950 to 2000. This period was dominated by the vertically integrated state electricity commissions. After the Second World War, there were serious power shortages in most states and the commissions embarked on major construction programs. The 50 years of expansion was of course closely coupled to Australia's economic growth post-war. The Snowy Hydro Scheme was built between 1949 and 72 including the first interstate connection between New South Wales and Victoria in 1959. And gas was first used for electricity production in 1961 at Roma in Queensland. Major industrial loads, including smelters, were commissioned in this period with state support. A wave of microeconomic reform then began in the 1990s including productivity reviews of the electricity sector. These reviews led to the breakup of the state commissions, corporatization, and in many cases, privatization of those disaggregated businesses. And it led to establishment of the national electricity market, the NEM, connecting the Eastern states into a single system and market. Similar reforms were implemented in the Southwest of Western Australia, creating the WEN. The NEM is a remarkable entity. Physically, it's one of the largest interconnected electricity systems in the world. And institutionally, it exists by the consent of the connected states under unanimously agreed legislation. The National Electricity Law is an act of the South Australian Parliament applied in other jurisdictions through application acts that point to that SA law. And this was all achieved through COAG, the Council of Australian Governments, overcoming the economic efficiencies create inefficiencies created by the constitution. Climate policy first appeared during this period with the first renewable energy target implemented in 1997. The electricity system at the end of this period was still dominated by coal, but with the more flexible gas and hydro generators now playing an important peaking role. Then came the disruption period, the 20 years from 2000 to 2020. So at the end of the 20th century, we had a corporatized and partly privatized electricity industry 
a nascent national electricity market in the east and a new market structure in the west. This was all intended to be the foundation for an economically efficient system with competition in generation and retail, economic regulation in transmission and distribution, and private capital investing to meet new growth. And it was all governed by the legislated national energy objective of meeting the long-term interests of consumers with respect to the price, reliability, and security of electricity supply. Well, this plan was quickly disrupted. Four factors are evident. First, the market designs were not settled and a continuing program of reviews and reforms was commenced. Second, overall demand stagnated, decoupling from economic growth, but it also became much more peaky driven in large part by household air conditioning. Then there was climate policy. This new imperative was addressed by multiple policy interventions by multiple governments, significantly changing investment dynamics and changing the role of consumers. The polite term in the literature for this period is policy discontinuity. Finally, closely related, there was the dramatic technology shifts that started to occur with wind and solar generation cost reductions and world leading take up of rooftop distributed solar. Storage technology also appeared with the first big batteries installed, household batteries alongside those PV systems and major new pump hydro projects announced for the snowy and Tasmanian schemes. So during this disruption period, we saw a boom in renewable energy investment, a super cycle it's been called. We saw the first economic retirement of coal generators. We saw some periods of unacceptably high electricity prices, and we had ongoing uncertainty over climate policy. And we saw a state blackout. The, the September 2016 blackout in South Australia, following an extreme weather event, triggered yet another review of energy policy with further reforms to markets and governance. Notably for our purposes, this included the requirement for AEMO, the energy market operator, to produce a biennial integrated system plan, ISP. There is also a similar planning document in Western Australia, the whole of system plan or the WASP. This disruption period laid the foundations for the net zero transition, including for the truism that it will be a bumpy ride. So let's now look at that net zero transition from 2020 to 2050. The first thing to say about this is that the pathway cannot be predicted with confidence. The paths shown on the graph here are taken from the ISP and WASP net zero scenarios. But they're just that, scenarios, they're not forecasts and they're certainly not plans in the literal sense. The scenarios are based on multiple transparent assumptions, many of which though have high degrees of uncertainty. Notwithstanding the uncertainties in timing and scale, the net zero transition as we see it today is, is expected to include the core elements of coal closure, renewable growth, new firming capacity, more transmission lines, more market reform, electrification of more of the economy and hydrogen. Taken as a whole, this is the electrify everything scenario with hydrogen being used where electrification is not possible. Sir John Monash would have recognized this strategy. Let's look at each of these elements and some of the uncertainties. We'll start with coal closures. The retirement of high emitting generation is of course central to a net zero outcome. Since the last coal generator in the NEM was commissioned just in 2007, creating a peak of 28 gigawatts, around five gigawatts is already retired and a further 18 gigawatts or more are expected to retire by 2040. The challenge is how to ensure that these critical resources don't retire before the replacement capacity is built. 
a problem which is exacerbated by the inevitable decline in reliability of aging plant. Distributed growth. We now have over 3 million small scale PV solar systems in Australia, combined capacity of 17 gigawatts and more growth to come. And household batteries will continue to grow as will batteries on wheels, otherwise known as electric vehicles. These distributed resources embedded inside the distribution networks have profoundly changed the dynamics of our power systems with new records regularly being set for minimum operational demand. Consumer participation. The distributed resources have also contributed to a major change in the way consumers engage with electricity. Coupled with digital technologies, new virtual power plant models are growing and many household and commercial consumers are more actively managing their consumption. Electricity prosumers operating consumer energy resources are a new form of market participant. And flexible commercial and industrial load will also play a critical role in new two-sided markets. So electricity consumers will have real agency in this transition. Wind and solar growth. Grid scale wind and solar capacity must of course accelerate. To cover the coal closures and the lower capacity factors, we'll need to build new renewable capacity at over four times the rate achieved for the last 20 years, not counting distributed PV. This is an average of four and a half gigawatts per year, and our best year to date was 2010 at three gigawatts. Two important new developments are the creation of renewable energy zones or reses by the states to enable more efficient development and the expected deployment of offshore wind where Australia can benefit from major technology improvements already achieved in the Northern Hemisphere. And connecting these new renewable generators to the grid has already emerged as a major technical challenge, requiring new tools such as power system simulation. Then we get to storage growth. Storage, of course, is a critical resource for a system that will be dominated by variable wind and solar. Batteries and pump hydro are the leading technologies now, with operating time scales from hours to weeks. The Snowy 2.0 scheme currently under construction will provide two gigawatts of generation for a continuous 175 hours. That's a week. These storage resources will be critical to help cover weather variab variability and to provide vital system security services, such as power system strength, frequency control and black start. And we certainly expect significant further technological development in this area. Gas firming. Our current scenarios show gas continuing to play a key role in the firming of wind and solar generation. The volume of gas will be relatively low in the fuel mix, but the value to the system will be very high. Emissions from natural gas power generation will of course need to be captured or offset, but future gas capacity may include zero emission hydrogen. The dispatchability of storage and firming, the certainty that these resources will be available when needed are critical to enabling the very, very deep penetration of renewable energy. Transmission growth. Transmission, including interconnection between states, is a major element here. Very little new transmission was built over the last 20 years through that disruption period, but that is now changing dramatically. New transmission is needed to strengthen the grid in wind and solar regions, including the reses, and more interconnection is needed to capture the benefits of geographic diversity. In the NEM, AEMO identifies around 10,000 kilometres of new transmission lines by 2050, but much of that is required over the next decade. This will require a build rate of, again, four times the recent historical rate. So the catch cry of no transition without transmission is real. 
market changes. Our market designs must also change. As we transition from a centralised system dominated by fossil fuels to a system dominated by distributed renewables, we need new market rules for functions such as capacity, system security, transmission development, and demand side participation, to name just a few. And gas market reform has already been added to that list of this year. Our big market changes are complex to design and implement, balancing the competing interests of stakeholders with the long-term interests of consumers. The recent change in the NEM from a 30-minute settlement period to a five-minute period took four years from the rule change decision to commencement of the new system. It cost the market operator over $100 million to implement and many multiples of that cost to market participants. I would note here that the proposed addition of an environmental element to the national energy objective, as already exists in Western Australia, will assist to guide the ongoing market changes in the NEM. Then we get to sector coupling. Electrification of the transport, manufacturing and heavy industry sectors with their coupling to the electricity system is a key element of the broader transition to a net zero emissions economy. These new sources of demand will have their own dynamics, which the net zero electricity system will need to manage. And then we get to hydrogen. Hydrogen has now become central to the net zero transition narrative. Now, some of us were around the last time that hydrogen was going to be the next big thing, uh, but this time it seems real with a large pipeline of projects worldwide. Hydrogen can replace fossil fuels in some sectors that are too hard to electrify. And of course, it is a potential major new Australian energy export. All nine Australian governments have hydrogen plans and major energy importing countries are actively pursuing this new energy carrier. Hydrogen production also has the very attractive feature of being a flexible load. The scale of this industry and the extent to which the electrolyzers are con actually connected to the NEM and the WEM remain a significant uncertainty. And this all leads us to demand growth. This is one of the largest uncertainties in this transition. The speed and scale of this growth will largely be a function of the electrification and hydrogen elements that I've mentioned. But the base case is a doubling in energy delivered through the electricity grid. Other scenarios show much greater demand, but the doubling alone in the NEM will require a nine-fold increase in utility scale renewable generation, a five-fold increase in distributed solar generation, a three-fold increase in firming capacity, and a major expansion of transmission. These elements of the current transition are all underway now, but the bumps keep coming. This year, we've seen the suspension of the NEM for nine days in June, and the commencement of a cycle of major electricity price rises. The war in Ukraine is a key driver, but it illustrates, tragically in the Ukraine case, the adage that stuff happens. Both events have quite properly triggered major policy responses. Now, the elements that I've listed here are highly interdependent with significant risks if any happen too fast or too slow. So this transition is essentially an orchestration and risk management problem involving nine governments, public and private enterprises, incumbents and disruptors with high uncertainty and inevitable shocks from both domestic and international sources. And of course, it's also fundamental to Australia's social, economic and environmental future. Just going back to this slide, there are some notable themes across these four transitions. The first three were driven by economic factors while the fourth is driven by a global externality, climate change. The net zero transition is the first to have an explicit timeline and an outcome 
which are both painfully simple to measure. It's also notable how the role of governments and markets have evolved over time as the context has changed. We're clearly now in a cycle of greater market intervention as governments seek to manage the risks and indeed to capture the opportunities of this transition. That wheel may turn again later in the transition, but for the issues that we are facing now, I think it's a perfectly natural development. It's the political economy at work. Lastly, it's notable that the tipping points between these transitions are all associated with a failure in one or more component of the classic energy trilemma, price, reliability, and sustainability. Society expects all three to be delivered simultaneously and any failure will trigger change. Price, reliability, and sustainability are the punctuation marks in the longer narrative of Australian electricity transitions. So before turning to the requirements for this to be a success, I want to spend a few minutes looking at a day in part of the men. This is South Australia. A few weeks ago on Sunday 16th of October, when a new record was set for minimum operational demand, just 100 megawatts in a state with an average spring peak of 1,700 megawatts. <laughs> For the NEM, South Australia is a postcard from the future. So I've chosen it to illustrate some of the elements of the net zero transition. The core engineering concept here is that the system operator is continuously managing two fundamental physical requirements. Reliability, that there is sufficient supply to meet demand at all times and security, that the system is stable with respect to frequency, mm -hmm. voltage, inertia, strength, et cetera, at all times. Now in fossil fuel dominated systems, security is largely provided by the synchronous generators, but wind, solar and batteries are asynchronous. So other technologies are needed to maintain system security. At the start of the 24 hours shown, the left of the graph, midnight, the electricity demand was being met by wind and gas, that's the two greens, plus imports from Victoria over the interconnector, the grey area at the bottom. At dawn, the solar kicked in and we saw the distribu distributed generation begin to erode the operational demand, ramping down dispatchable generation. And by the middle of the day, South Australian demand was mostly being met by rooftop solar, with some grid solar also contributing. Between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., we can see that there was some gas and wind still operating, and South Australia was exporting power to Victoria. In the evening, gas and uh, in the evening, gas filled the gap until the wind picked up again, and by midnight, the wind was dominant and South Australia was again exporting electricity. The battery activity, those little purple patches you can see at the shoulders uh, of the ramping periods, they represent discharging. The South Australian big batteries were charging in the middle of the day and at the same time providing essential system security services. Now behind this very simple story, three things were also happening. First, the AERO operators were continually looking at the forecast for distributed PV production, 24 hours, four hours, and one hour ahead, and at all of the other system parameters, and determined that on this day, the South Australian operating conditions would be system normal, with the interconnector fully operational. Now, there are other operating conditions under which the risks and response would have been quite different such as reduced capacity on the interconnector, major weather events, or South Australia operating as an island. Second, the four South Australian synchronous condensers, syncons, large spinning machines connected to the transmission network, were running throughout the day 
providing core system strength. And finally, the minimum two gas generators were directed to run through the daylight period to provide synchronous power and the flexibility to respond to unforeseen events. So there's a lot of intervention happening behind this graph. The graph would look very different if deep storage were available or hydrogen electrolyzers were operating in the region. These would both respond to price signals. The storage would probably charge during the middle of the day and discharge during the morning and evening ramping periods. And the electrolyzers would run whenever prices were low, such as in the middle of a sunny day. In an emergency, both the storage and the electrolyzers could be directed on or off by AEMA, effectively operating as scheduled loads. And the new South Australia, New South Wales interconnector, Project Energy Connect, which is currently under construction, will also significantly change this picture, providing both market and operational benefits. Now, more broadly, new records for minimum operational demand and renewable generation are being set almost every month in the NEM and the WEM. On Friday, 28 October, the instantaneous level of renewable generation in the NEM hit 69% over a 30 minute interval, 70% for five minutes, with 18 megawatts of wind and solar generation. AEMO is planning for the NEM and the WEM to be able to operate for periods of 100% renewables by just 2025. Operating gigawatt scale power systems at 100% renewables is a challenge that is unparalleled worldwide. And to enable this to happen without having to constrain the renewable generation or to direct on synchronous coal or gas, AEMO must re-engineer the grid, reconfiguring multiple power system planning and operation systems such that security can be maintained without the large synchronous generators. As the transition to net zero progresses, new technologies such as grid forming inverters fitted to the renewable generators and batteries will contribute to this task. So this was an easy, predictable, sunny weekend day in South Australia. Severe weather events or significant shifts in demand would have produced a very different story, as I've said, with much greater operator interventions. And AEMO observes that events classified as low probability, high impact are actually becoming more frequent. The probability is changing. It all illustrates that flexibility and resilience are the new bywords for power system operation. Western Australia is experiencing the same dynamics, but without the benefit of interconnection and geographic diversity. They do, however, have a well-functioning capacity market. On this same day in October, the WEN experienced a period when sufficient renewable resources were available to supply 100% of demand. The actual penetration at the time was curtailed to 75%, but most of that was rooftop solar delivering that level. And since this is the ANU solar oration, this is a good point to acknowledge the role that Australian researchers have played in the global phenomena of solar energy, all the yellow and orange parts and the graphs that I've shown. This includes some people in this room and we are certainly all in their debt. Let's finish with the requirements for a successful net zero electricity transition in Australia. First, I have to define success. I define it as one that delivers against three fundamental criteria. Environmental, obviously. A sustainable electricity system, delivering net zero emissions and probably powering negative emission technologies. Social, where impacted communities, households, businesses, industry, regions are genuinely engaged and overwhelmingly supportive because it's seen as fair and just. And economic, Australia will have returned to a comparative advantage in electricity prices 
supporting energy intensive manufacturing and green exports. So how do we achieve that outcome? Here are the five key requirements as I see them today. First technologies. While the core technologies of wind, solar and storage are all progressing very well at a stunning rate, and we're benefiting from global research and global scale, there is still much more to be done. Two examples that I've already mentioned are electrolyzer technologies for producing hydrogen and technologies for maintaining system security, such as grid forming inverters. And the net zero transition is occurring in the era of big data and hyper connectivity, presenting new opportunities in the integration of systems and markets and in consumer participation. The downside, of course, is cyber security, which is a major issue for all modern energy systems. But on balance, there is every reason to be optimistic that the technologies will be available for a successful transition. Markets. Every liberalised electricity market will face specific challenges in market reform, which will need to be solved in the context of their legacy systems and markets. And while we can seek some lessons from overseas, our starting point is the NEM, the WEM and our smaller grids. There is a major reform program underway to adapt our markets to the new technological paradigm, which includes extensive stakeholder consultations. Reform can be a torturous process for a market in steady state, but it's even more complex for a market in transition. Some have observed that it takes longer to change a market rule than it does to build a solar power station. The good news is that market reform issues, as we understand them today, are all on the table and work is progressing. The challenge will be timely decision making and implementation, including the industry's ability to absorb so much change in a short period. Let's talk about infrastructure. The infrastructure build rate we need is a much bigger problem and it's part of a global issue. The unprecedented rate required for new generation, storage and transmission, more than four times what we've done so far, will require active management of a portfolio of major construction projects. Labor, skills and supply chain issues will be under great pressure and this in turn will lead to pressures on timelines and budgets. And that's before we get to social license. We know what infrastructure needs to be built over the next decade and industry and governments are certainly focused on the problem, but this is a significant uncertainty for the transition at this stage. And then governance. The governance model for the Australian electricity systems, complicated by our constitution, was designed for an era of incremental change and predictable investment. And as we've seen, this is not what happened during the disruption period, and the model has struggled to adapt. The economic policy mantra of markets if possible, governments if necessary, is being stressed by the rate of change and the attendant risks and opportunities. The transition task requires agile decision-making based on dynamic scenarios and risk management. Now it's notable that energy ministers have recently announced a new national energy transformation partnership, one of the most important governance reforms since the COAG Australian Energy Market Agreement was signed in 2004. This development shifts the focus of policy making from economic efficiency to transition management and reflects, of course, the climate policy alignment of the nine Australian governments. The next frontier in energy governance will be when we can move the focus from risk management to opportunity capture. And finally, social licence. Australia will need new approaches to obtaining and retaining a social licence for electricity infrastructure investment. A successful transition must encompass the perspectives and well-being of people in the context of their lives, 
communities and employment in a way that is fair. Genuine engagement and overwhelming support, overwhelming support are a tall order for this transition, but anything less will jeopardise success. And I think we're only beginning to come to terms with what a just transition will actually mean for Australia. Again, governments and industries are alert to the problem and new approaches are emerging. States are explicitly addressing the needs of emissions intensive regions and new methods of benefit sharing are being implemented in some renewable energy zones and transmission projects. And these are all welcome developments. But social license is not just about infrastructure development and regional adjustment. The quickest way to lose the social license for the electricity transition as a whole is to drop the ball on price and reliability. Governments and market bodies are very highly motivated to avoid this. Now, these five requirements for success are, like so much of the transition, highly interdependent and dynamic. The optimum policy response to each will evolve over the course of the transition. It will simply not be a linear, central and planned journey. Agility and risk management will be more important than efficiency and predictability. Much of the policy focus and public discourse over the last few years has been on the first two of these requirements, technology and markets. I would argue that getting these two right is certainly necessary, but by no means sufficient. We must also successfully manage the infrastructure and governance elements and central to everything, the social license dimensions. Now this argument also applies to publicly funded research where the social sciences have often been the poor cousins to technology and engineering research. We need focused and impactful research across all five of these requirements. To conclude, the energy transition literature suggests three characteristics of successful transitions from history from an innovation perspective. These are policy persistence, alignment of actors and balanced portfolios. The current Australian net zero transition is trending positively against all three. We've certainly reached a peak in alignment between governments on industry and where we're headed. And the five more specific requirements that I've presented are consistent with that research while reflecting the particular Australian situation. The Australian net zero transition uh, scenario that I've outlined is also consistent with a global outlook for electricity as recently published by the International Energy Agency in their 2022 World Energy Outlook. The fuel mixes and time scales differ, of course, but the themes are exactly the same. The IEA cleverly suggests that the global outlook for electricity is as bright as the sun. I certainly believe that this applies in Australia, where we have all of the ingredients for a bright success. Thank you. And we have about half an hour to ask some questions. So we have some people in the room with microphones who will allow you to directly ask a question. And we also have on VBOX the ability to post a question. So while we're getting VBOX set up, I'd like to invite Pim to ask the first question. Yes, so uh, in, from any of the European Union, just, just, just wait a moment because everyone on the internet wants to hear you too. Okay, so, uh, so thank you for that. Question. My question is how the risk is for Australia to act for green hydrogen for Asia? What's your opinion? Okay, the question was how, how realistic do I think? 
green hydrogen exports to Asia is for Australia? Well, um, I don't know that there's a lot of money being bet on it being successful, and that's a darn good sign. Uh, and it's, as my colleague Alan Finkel uh, describes it, um, it's, uh, it's very much an issue of finding the demand uh, in that uh, we've got challenges on both sides of the contract. Uh, cheap production at volume uh, and demand at a price that we can match at volume. But there is so many major projects worldwide focusing on this program and energy importing countries looking at it as how they um, diversify their fuel mix to a clean mix that I, if I was betting, I think it's going to happen. Will it be the scale in some of the very optimistic scenarios? I don't know, but, but it certainly seems uh, a good bet for Australia. I, I mentioned the IEA World Energy Outlook. They've got a, a nice section on that, looking at in the gaseous fuels an outlook for hydrogen. The two major exporters of hydrogen worldwide in their scenarios are Australia and the Middle East slash North Africa. What do we have in common? Abundant solar energy. Um, they perhaps have a little advantage in proximity to markets, but we have some very strong markets in our region in Asia. So I'm cautiously optimistic. The actual size, that's the big unknown. Okay, so there's a question on the, um, from the online audience. Um, in your opinion, would it be a good idea or otherwise to have a referendum successfully passed to centralise uh, responsibility for energy on the federal government rather than eight state governments? Yeah. <laughs> this, this is the ultimate, in theory, hypothetical <laughs> question that I... It'll never happen. What I think about it is completely irrelevant. It won't happen. <laughs> the, the rules for, for uh, constitutional change are extremely high. And, this, and you know, given that no state or territory would support such a referendum, it's got zip chance, not worth the effort. We can make the current model work. Perhaps the, the better answer to the question is, is it necessary? <laughs> And I would argue, no, today, the alignment of the nine governments are around the net zero transition, that was the critical precondition. Uh, and we've demonstrated already in the creation of the MEM that when the policies are aligned, the governments can work together and get a good outcome. We just got a new problem to solve, but the mechanism is proven. Okay, so uh, an internal question now. Hi, um, Jacinta Evans, um, Director of Gas Transition Built Environment for ACT Government. I had a similar question actually, but more about uh, your thoughts on Victoria's announcement of taking their um, power generation back into, or part of the power generation back into state hands. Uh, your thoughts on how this might affect the market and if it's an attractive or appropriate pathway for other states to consider. So, all state and territory governments uh, have got programs to support the transition of uh, their electricity sectors. And, you know, they all start, uh, they all have legacy starting points and they're not the same. Um, you know, Victoria went the whole way with corporatisation and privatisation. Queensland never did, to put two, two examples. Uh, and West Australia has a mixed model and, and so on. So just this year, we've seen major announcements from Queensland with a, with a just stunning set of investment projects completely aligned with the, the framework I presented. Uh, New South Wales model has, is maturing with the first tender for their uh, uh, contracts to underwrite new renewable generation in reses um, are currently being assessed now. And Victoria has made that announcement about reconstituting the State Electricity Commission for building new renewable generation. So this is the point that I was saying that governments, where, where, where the cycle has swung back to governments intervening to manage risks and capture opportunities. Uh, the models are quite different. The New South Wales model is very different from the Queensland model. 
Um, ACT has had a particular set of circumstances that Minister Rattenbury has given us an update on. Tasmania, a very different starting point with the dominant Tassie Hydro. So I, I just look at these state programs and I broadly see rational policy making interventions from the governments in the context of their legacy systems and the risks that they are trying to manage. They're all still dispatching into a, the NEM is still there. It is still a physically interconnected system and the interconnection will become deeper. Uh, the single market, the wholesale market is still there. It needs to evolve, but they're still working in that. So many of the, many of the efficiencies of the national approach that was uh, created just over 20 years ago will prevail through this period of state intervention. So I'm, I'm not alarmed about it. I just see it or, and I'm not gonna pick a winner. Um, they're all valid, but they, but they all, they're different, but the differences are completely explainable by the context of those state-based systems. So as we um, increase hydrogen production to at least meet the demands of the chemical industry to replace methane in the chemical industry, there is the obvious possibility that it rises far beyond that and in fact ends up with being multiple amounts of energy compared with our local electricity consumption in order to do all this electrolyzing of water. How would you see a, um, an electricity system operating where, for example, two thirds or three quarters of the electricity was used for producing export products and only a little bit, the tail, uh, for local consumption. And th this again is, you know, I, I think the whole hydrogen scenario is one of the biggest uncertainties in, in, in this, uh, this, this transition that we're at the start of. And I, I mentioned in my presentation that amongst it, we don't know how big it'll be to the first question we're asked. We don't know whether the markets will be, how big they will be. And we would expect to have competition if there are the big markets. We also don't know whether the production of that export hydrogen will be grid connected, will be connected to the NEM or the WEM. Some of the optimum regions for very large scale solar driven hydrogen production are nowhere near the NEM and the WEM and there won't be a business case to connect. So from a market operator's perspective, the more load, the better. It creates diversity, minimizes risk, gets better value out of common infrastructure. So we'd love there to be more load, but I, we just don't know how much of that hydrogen load, if, and we hope it does materialize, will actually be grid connected. So in that context, would you support the connection of uh, Perth with um, the eastern states and Perth with the Pilbara, for example, I think, using HVDC? I, th I think uh, Trans-Australian inter Interconnector is unlikely to be uh, needed, economic uh, or needed. Uh, I think the WA, the diversity that is able to be captured in WA is fine. Uh, I, I think extending the SWIS, the Southwest Interconnected System, which is the physical system on which the WEM operates, north uh, is certainly a distinct possibility. But, you know, I, this, this goes back to, this isn't a centrally planned transition, right? No one can sit in an office and get out a texter and make a decision on, on these things. The market dynamics, the technology developments will shape the way these things go. So, the next question from the room. Oh, so, one of the technologies that's mentioned is to go to slide the current papers where you see there are significant projects <coughs> being born according to what project around the world, so from Morocco to Europe. Yep. Spain, Portugal, and the UK. And in, and in Asia, there's some yes, very large ones. Yes, Australia, Singapore, Cape, Norway, to the UK. Uh, but anyway, so I was wondering if you saw that uh, as, as being fundamentally transformational technology for distributing electricity around uh, both around the world and 
brand Australia or something. Potentially, potentially. Uh, and, but I, so I think it's a it's a great question, and of course it will be HVDC um, if we with the new interconnectors across Bass Strait, the Marinus Link project, uh, and whether the next generation of big transmission projects beyond those that are all on the table now would be benefit from uh, HVDC. I think that is a, a great and open question. Right now, a lot of the, um, you know, I, I mentioned in my presentation, Project Energy Connect, which is a very long interconnector uh, between South Australia and New South Wales. That will also go straight through a new renewable energy zone in southern New South Wales, which means that these big interconnectors are also strengthening the actual transmission out to uh, very high value renewable energy areas as well. <laughs> So it's, it's another great example where we don't know what technologies will be optimum uh, as, the, as the transition unfolds. But yeah, I certainly you know, see an open mind to whether high voltage DC uh, transmission could play a role. The, um, the future electricity markets, both in Western Australia and in the East are going to be quite complicated with uh, distributed generation and consumption and a network of transmission and solar and wind and batteries and electric vehicles and lots and lots of other things. How important is it, do you think, that um, people be educated about the complexity or is it safe to allow the experts to look after that and just present a fairly anodyne view of the world? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Andrew. And so I, I mentioned uh, consumer participation as one of the dynamics that, that, that is now come from very, very low 20 years ago to now quite significant, not least as a result of the 3 million households that have put PV on their roofs. Uh, I, again, it's another uncertainty. We know that some consumers, prosumers, uh, will want to be very active participants uh, in electricity systems and will make active decisions about that. But once they've chosen their supplier and clicked the contract, are they actually going to do anything other than look at their app uh, from time to time? I don't know. Uh, when we sort out a good regime for the charging electric vehicles inside the distribution networks that works for the benefit of consumers, of, for the benefit of the drivers of the EVs and for the distribution network and hence the economy as a whole, will people actually care or will it all just be automated? I certainly think that the proportion of society that wants to be actively involved will be much higher than it has been in the past. But will it be 10% or 50% or beyond? I don't know, but it will be significant. <clears throat> and those people will be loud and vocal. And as I said, they will have agency. The choices that they make will have an impact. We often talk about this as individuals and households. The same applies to businesses and industry that will also have a lot more agency uh, in the systems that we're building now. Okay, and so on. Uh, thanks, Drew, an excellent presentation. Um, following on the question about exporting you know, solar you know, generation uh, to Singapore, uh, about six years ago, uh, Baskin, the, the link was broken, and it took about six months to repair it. Now, if I was a customer in Singapore, <laughs> relying perhaps heavily on the Australian, you know, electricity, and there was either an accident or maybe a certain country who won't name decided, well, we might just snip this cable. Uh, I mean, that might sound a little preposterous, but what happened in Ukraine is not, you know, that makes it sound a little bit more possible. Anyhow, I suppose. Uh, my question is, uh, the concern over energy security from the Ukraine war, would that put a big dampener 
on demand for electricity from Australia to Singapore, for example? So I think I can make the case that it's quite the opposite uh, is the impact. So firstly, you're absolutely right that uh, Ukraine and Russian gas to Western Europe has highlighted energy security in Western economies in a, in a very dramatic and, and, as I mentioned, tragic way. Um, so for probably the best example um, in our region in which Australia has benefited uh, are our friends in Japan that have been actively managing, you know, are highly dependent on energy imports uh, and have been for a long time and actively manage the diversity of supply um, to manage that risk. So that, that cable to Singapore, um, the proposed development, as I recall the numbers, it will provide a significant proportion of Singapore electricity, but not so great that the system wouldn't have contingencies to, to cope with the outage. And so this is all about risk management and contingencies and diversity and diversity of supply and flexibility are the answer. So rather than thinking about it as building a dependence, I think you should think about it as adding a diversity. So um, carbon pricing. Do you think that we'll get carbon pricing by direct fiat or by stealth? And how would you regard that as relative importance in a rapid and um, effective transition? No, I don't, and I don't think it's important. I think we've, <laughs> I think we've moved past it. Um, it's, it's not on the critical path of anything that I've talked about tonight. Thanks, Drew. And Morgan from ANU. Just to, as a follow up directly from that, given that there is a, an environmental objective now in the electricity law, and, and given that there won't be a price on carbon in the foreseeable future, what are the most likely options to uh, ensure that the environmental objective is met? And could this include an internal electricity price on carbon? If the problem statement is defined as a transition to net zero emissions at minimum cost and maintaining security and reliability, which is what I think is the problem statement, then the rulemaking process, which is bound by the national electricity objective, and when that is amended to include, in effect, um, the net zero requirement, I think it'll just fall into place, Kim. And so defining the problem statement as that pathway in the interests of consumers, and we know what the consumers' interests are, price and reliability, you uh, drop either of those, uh, you, you can't, you simply can't. And so it's getting to that end point is what, um, and clarity around that, is what that um, addition of the environmental objective will give us. If we only have an endpoint, there are many trajectories possible for that endpoint. Yeah, which is why I talk about dynamic, agile scenarios, risk management. And if, if, and I know you're not suggesting this, but the the theory that you know we add the environment objective and we sit here in 2022 and we write the plan to get to somewhere in the 30s, 40s and 50s. No, the pathways will change many times. There'll be shocks and bumps and disruptions along the way, but they will be guided by that objective at all times. And that simple transparent measure, I think will be very powerful. It's um, fairly well understood that transmission is uh, one of the key constraints on rapid rollout of solar farms and wind farms. Um, the incoming government allocated 20 billion to new transmission. Um, do you think that's enough? Do you think there's an appetite by the various state governments and the federal government to double it or whatever is required? The uh, rewiring the nation plan, which was the, the one that uh, the, the government have announced and are now implementing, 
uh, will provide great certainty and clarity to the financing of the urgent big transmission projects, including those identified by AEMO in the integrated system plan. Uh, will 20 billion cover it? It's a financing mechanism, remember, it's not a grant, it's a financing structure. Uh, it might well require more, but I, I think that 20 billion is such a big statement uh, and the structures that will be created around it in terms of the projects that it will deploy, I think will be a step change. But, but you know, the, the question that was asked before about other transmission technologies, I mentioned in my presentation that the, the system planning work that is done at the moment identifies a very significant buildup of interconnectors and transmission strengthening to renewable energy zones. And it's nearly all in the next 10 years. Now, if you recall the graph that I showed, the kick up in load in 10 years is not that great. When it's double, what will the next lot look like? I think there are still quite a few frontiers to come in transmission planning and development. I hope technology will, be, will, will deliver some of the solutions to it. I know that social license will be a significant issue to be managed uh, right through that. I, I don't think financing will be the rate limiting part of it. Okay, and of course, uh, social license in relation to transmission is really where the rubber hits the road, I would imagine. Uh, it's, it's one, but, but I, I see at the moment three geographies of social license. Um, one is transmission lines. One is renewable energy zones that will get concentrated solar and wind development. And the third is carbon intensive regions that are particularly coal-fired generation reasons. Now, those geographies are perfectly obvious. There's a whole social dimension to it as well that overlaps with, but is separate to those geographies. Indigenous peoples and their roles in the transition, low-income households and the disadvantages that they face, um, what it means for employment. There are many dimensions of this. Uh, and this, this all is my remark that, that I made in the presentation, that I think Australia is only just beginning to come to terms with what a just transition will actually mean. Okay, we just have a few minutes left. Um, so, Drew, I'd like to just invite you to give a summary of uh, where you think we are headed over the next few years, and then perhaps speak also about what does 2030 look like? Ah, that's, that's a good challenge, Andrew. Um, <laughs> look, the... I guess let me go back a few steps. One of the things I was trying to um, show in my, my presentation is that transitions have long arcs uh, and are a natural phenomenon. This one has certain dynamics that we're highly focused on. And right now, today, this year, they look, you know, almost really quite shocking in, some, in most senses of that term. But in that longer story of five, 10, 20 years, I'm quite confident that we will work through these bumps uh, and this will accelerate. Don't know what exactly the end point will look like, but it will accelerate. I think if, if we were sitting here in 2030, looking back eight years, uh, here's a couple of predictions. Some things will have happened that were not in any way mentioned in my presentation. There'll be external shocks, domestic or, or international. There'll be technology breakthroughs that have stunning impacts in the market. Um, there'll be new developments in demand side consumer participation. The only thing you know for sure in this game is it'll be different. But my, my sense is that will be a long, long way down the journey. We've already passed the point of no return. We're well, I think we're well past that. 
uh, I think we'll be a lot further down the road in 2030. Okay, well, on that optimistic note, um, I'd like to thank Drew very much for an excellent presentation and Q&A. And um, I'd like to also thank very much the, the people down the front here who did a lot of work and made the event run so smoothly, and in particular to um, Renee, who uh, mustered a large number of registrants and just made sure everything happened properly. So thank you very much to everyone concerned.